Next up on This Week in Law, we've got Evan Brown, Derek Kana, and me. We're going to talk about how Hollywood is blaming Google again, cell phone unlocking, NSA cracking net encryption, the best secret project name ever, and much more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown, episode 228, recorded September 20th, 2013. Operatic Poodles and Flying Pigs. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymous and unfiltered. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code TWILL. Hey there, I'm Denise Howell, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. I am so excited to chat this week with Derek Kana, who is joining us once again on Twill. It's always great to chat with you, Derek. You always have so many interesting things to say and get us up to speed on all the law and policy issues that affect tech. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Also joining us from Chicago, Illinois, and the Info Law Group is Evan Brown. Hello, Evan. Wonderful to see you, Denise. Derek, really uh, great to talk with you again. Looking forward to our conversation here. Great way to spend Friday afternoon. So, Derek, I didn't introduce you other than just welcoming back to the show very well. For people who haven't listened to your other appearances on This Week in, in Law, we should explain a little bit more who you are. You're a fellow with the Information Society Project at Yale right now and uh, a former staffer for the House Republican Study Committee. Is that right? That's right. Um, you worked on the Romney campaign. And for Senator Scott Brown, yep. uh, you went you went to Georgetown and are you know one of those Beltway Insider people, if uh, <laughs> if I can go ahead and call you that. Well, I, I make my way out to the Valley in Austin, Texas, and New York, so I, I I like to think I'm of two worlds as opposed to just being inside the Beltway. But I'll, I'll take the hit. Well, that well, no, that's the great thing about you is is you have a very thoroughgoing understanding of technology and tech business, and a thoroughgoing understanding of Washington and the way it works, and uh, the things to pay attention to there. So, so you're a unique creature, and uh, one that we're happy to have found in the wild, so that we can study and learn from you. <laughs> Um, also, uh, you're a prolific and, and wonderfully analytic writer and you write for Slate and the Atlantic, um, the Hills policy blog. Am I forgetting any of your regular outlets here? Well, I also write for National Review and Human Events and probably a bunch of other outlets that uh, maybe the technology community isn't as familiar with, but certainly many on the uh, Republican conservative side are. All right, good. Um, so now that we've uh, got folks acquainted with who you are, uh, let's talk about some of your recent writing, a uh, very recent one piece that you just uh, put up on Slate this morning, uh, having to do with Section 230, which is the reason that we have the social web. Now, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, for those unfamiliar with it, it's something we talk about a lot on the show, is a provision that provides a safety net for online service providers and shields them somewhat from the legal wrongs that their users may engage in while using their site. Uh, in the case of someone like Google, it provides cover for copyright infringement engaged in by users, uh, for example. Actually, no, it does not, right? Copyright is carved out explicitly from Section 230, and Google and others have to look to the DMCA for those kinds of protections, which operate similarly. Now, what Section 230 
more specifically targets is things like defamation and uh, other kinds of wrongdoing that are not federal crimes, potentially. Am I getting that right, Derek? That's correct. There are a few federal uh, statutes that are, are specifically exempted, such as intellectual property. But for the most part, it effectively says that uh, these service providers are not liable for the conduct of the users. Uh, so it's particularly important uh, in situations such as uh, defamation, uh, not, not alone, uh, not exclusively. Um, I don't know if you wanted to continue going on, I can, I can start talking right now about my article or um, whatever. Sure, abs on. absolutely. Let's give us some background, if you would about Section 230, how it functions, and then your article is is specifically um, about, well, you've written um, a couple of things about Section 230 recently, one in The Atlantic and one in Slate Today. Uh, the first article, more about the importance of Section 230 and why we very badly need it, and the second one about how it is under threat. So why don't we start uh, with the background. Why, why is it important? Why is it so critical to the web that we've become used to today? Sure. So it's part of the Communications Decency Act, which is actually a terrible bill for innovation. Uh, it was really dangerous for the whole internet. Um, it was dealing with basically holding web providers liable for uh, pornography. And it really, it, I mean, it had a noble purpose, but it was really stifling uh, to innovation, but the whole law was basically struck down um, as being unconstitutional, and then the judges actually kept Section 230 alive, uh, which was inserted by Senator Wyden, uh, who actually voted against the Communications Decency Act. So he, he made the bill much better before he decided to vote against it. Uh, a little bit of an interesting backstory there. And that so is interesting. The uh, Section 230 is is terrific because before this provision. Web providers, if they started monitoring the conduct content on their website, the more they were kind of involved in, in editing or you know jumping in, the more they were held liable. And so what that means is, let's say that Facebook intervened when you, if if you threatened to kill somebody on your wall, you know, if they intervened, then they could be held liable in the future for not intervening in all situations. So it actually created a perverse incentive for those type of websites to not do any sort of policing. And Section 230 just says, we're giving you immunity. You know, you can do whatever you want here. And that's what has led to Twitter and Facebook and all these other user-generated websites that have existed since that time. And as a result, we've seen some of these websites do increasingly better job of self-policing their own content. You know, Facebook, you can report other people's conduct. So it's not like there's nothing in the room to deal with these problems. But there's enough wiggle room for user-generated content, uh, which is why you see it everywhere. Even on my Atlanta column, there's comments of people pro and against it, uh, which could not have existed before Section 230. Right, so because, the, sorry, and that, and that is because you, you simply can't stay in business as an online service provider, as the Atlantic hosting comments, when you could be sued at the drop of a hat for something that someone has come along over whom you have no control uh, and posted on your site. Absolutely, and, and as as you as you well know, uh, you know these websites like Facebook and you know presumably Google, they have sufficient coffers, so they're actually really good people to sue if you could hold them liable. Right. So the the liability was was quite extreme, and so what we're seeing now, unfortunately. Um, is that this is one of the you know, real clear provisions within law. It's just said to innovators, you know, create a website, let users generate content, and you're not liable for it. And we've seen this incredible growth of websites that were you know, relatively basic websites. You know, Facebook started out as just you know, sharing photos with each other, essentially, and kind of blossomed from that. Um, and so it really creates a low barrier to entry. Um, now we have 47 attorney generals uh, who have filed a letter with Congress trying to uh, change the language of Section 230. And they really only want to add two words, but it's probably the most consequential two words ever petitioned to Congress. Um, and it would effectively strip um, everything about Section 230. And they have a, you know, a noble goal. They're trying to deal with child prostitution. Um, but in so doing, they basically negate all the protection schemes here. Right. So don't hold us in suspense. What are the two words? Well, right now it says that they're, they're, uh, that, that it, it, 
Right now, it provides immunity except for specific federal statutes uh, and federal uh, intervention. Here, it would add the, the words or state uh, to mm -hmm. allow for state torts um, to not be under the statute. Uh, and thereby, you have defamation, you have whatever the states want to throw for a secondary liability for um, child prostitution. I'm not exactly sure exactly what they would charge people with, but presumably they found something as, you know, this is the point of adding the, the, the situation there. And what that means is for Backpage or for Craigslist, um, they would have to police all listings on their website to ensure that there's nothing that involves a minor. And you can imagine how onerous that could be. Uh, one, because people typically don't say on Craigslist or back you know Backpage, out and out, this is prostitution. They usually use some sort of you know, euphemism. And two, um, because usually you don't know if it's a child involved. Um, mm -hmm. So it would really be a pretty high standard of policing, um, which we, we do have in some industries. You know, with pornography, for example, there's very detailed requirements on how much information you have to have on every performer that's in a, in a video, down to their social security number and their address. Um, but that level of real note taking and rigor for something like professional pornography as a you know multi billion dollar industry is just impossible for a user generated website to implement that, um, both with Craigslist and with Backpage. But even theoretically, if somebody wanted to post on their own Facebook wall, um, you know, here's some child prostitute. Um, you know, the level of engagement that Facebook and Twitter and all these, these websites would have to have to police would be pretty or Orwellian um, and, and pretty dangerous. Right. So, Evan, we've kind of set the stage here. And, and at the beginning of the show, I was uh, tripping myself up with the fact that intellectual property is specifically carved out. Uh, of Section 230, this would create another carve out. Now, sites can dash over to the DMCA to have a whole other uh, safe harbor system uh, whereby they can not be liable if they comply with certain conditions for their users' intellectual property uh, type violations. Is this the kind of situation where we're going to need a separate rubric aside from Section 230 um, to help shield websites, or are they just going to be hanging out to dry and have to do a whole lot more um, scrutiny and policing themselves if these state attorneys general get their way? Well, if the state attorneys general get their way and put this, uh, you know, broaden this, it, it, it gets kind of weird when we start talking about how Section 230 immunity works because there's the mm -hmm. immunity that's afforded by Section 230C, which says that the platform can't be treated as the publisher or speaker of this, of the information that's provided by third parties. But then there is that exception to the immunity. And what uh, we're talking about here is the, the exception to the immunity that's found in Section 230E1, saying that this shouldn't be construed to impair the enforcement of any federal criminal statute. And the attorneys general want to add in that this immunity shouldn't limit or impair the enforcement of any state uh, criminal statute as well. So I, I don't see why it would result in any new kind of rubric or why that would be necessary. Uh, it certainly would put a greater onus on the sites to do something in the event that they learn of the violation of state criminal laws uh, being done on their site. Child prostitution is the best and uh, easiest example for that, or any kind of state uh, uh, criminal law. I think that we could even take this perhaps even closer to home for a lot of people because fortunately it's a very small minority of people who are involved in violation of state law uh, for child prostitution or child pornography, but something more like criminal harassment under a state statute. I think that's something that could be very effective if we were to add in that exception to immunity for this. Now, just like in our discussion with the DMCA, we, we remind our listeners to this as often as, as possible, just because uh, 
you don't qualify for the immunity as the service provider, whether that be under Section 512 of the DMCA, you haven't jumped through all the hoops to say that you're not liable for the copyright infringement occasioned for your users, or just because in Section 230, you may not be uh, afforded this immunity for whatever reason, like uh, in a roommates.com uh type of Ninth Circuit uh, scenario or whatever, that doesn't mean that you're automatically liable for that underlying tort. It just doesn't, it just means that you don't have that 12B6 uh, defense available to, you know, to get the case thrown out at the, at the very beginning here. So, you know, it is troubling uh, at the end of the day to see um, anything done to limit the Section 230 immunity because no doubt we would not enjoy the, um, the, you know, the robustness of the social web uh, that we see today. We wouldn't enjoy the robustness of the, the web as we see it today. I mean, the first appellate court decisions under Section 230 go all the way back to 1997. The case calls Zaran in front of the Fourth Circuit. So this was long before what we call, you know, Web 2.0 or the social web or whatever. Um, but at, at, at on balance, I don't know that it's going to ruin Section 230. It's not going to mean that we're set back into the, the uh, Internet Stone Age if this were to go in. Uh, there would be positives of having sites be more responsible, um, you know, take a bigger responsibility for seeing what's going on there if there is actually criminal stuff going on and people are being harmed. Um, here we can insert our discussion that we've had in the last few weeks about revenge porn. You know, it mm -hmm. would be great if there is a mechanism for... Uh, the operators of, uh, you know, like um, isanyoneup.com or you got post or whatever. It'd be great if, if the, those site owners, those platform operators uh, were uh, felt a little bit more heat under state uh, criminal statutes. So, you know, it would, it, it's troubling to, to narrow the immunity, but there is a certain upside to it as well that represents uh, important, important uh, public policy considerations. Right. Well, Derek, let me just frame it this way. We've already got provisions in the law that recognize that we want to discourage crimes from taking place, federal crimes, and we want the sites to have an interest in helping make sure that does not happen. Is it just, is the difference here that there are so many more laws in play when we fold in state criminal laws? And of course, everyone at one point or another has been forwarded you know, a funny email or a funny website that aggregates all the wacky state laws that are out there. Uh, and for example, I just pulled one up that says, in Alabama, it's illegal to wear a fake mustache that causes laughter in church. Those kinds of laws <laughs> that- Is that uh, really a law? I don't know. I'm reading from a website. You can't trust what you see oh. on the internet, but people do, you know, there, there are crazy laws out there and people love to, you know, highlight them and aggregate them and make these lists. So um, is, is the danger that, you know, by trying to stop child prostitution and pornography, et cetera, you know, if that with that being the driving force that you're also going to sweep in a whole lot of other technically criminal activity that it would be impossible for websites to monitor and police. I mean, that, that's a real danger, but the, the bigger danger is that this doesn't actually get any step further towards accomplishing the goal it's trying to accomplish. I mm -hmm. mean, we can all say, well, maybe we should, you know, hurt all these user-generated websites if the benefit is less child, you know, prostitution. Uh, but that's just not... True, but, but before this law went into effect is really the best precedent for what would happen if there was this exception in this particular area. And before the law went into effect, the incentive structure was for websites to do no policing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Because if you do any policing, then you're liable under a tort system. You know, you, you should have been aware of what was going on in your website. And so right. to the extent that we have policing on these websites already, to the extent that we have uh, both Facebook and Twitter doing some monitoring, allowing for users to post stuff to them, for them to kind of flag and, 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 and you know and investigate, to the extent that Craigslist does any of that or Backpage does any of that, which albeit is minimal, uh, they, their incentive on day one would be turn that off. Do not do any sort of, of, you know, review here. Do not do any sort of protection for the end user because that's the only way to avoid all liability. They're rational actors. So that's actually not the best way to go about getting to this goal. So you're going to have websites that are already policing the content like Facebook and Twitter that aren't going to get out of the business and then they're encumbered by all these 
incredible liabilities. And then the next web pages, you know, I have one of my favorite new websites I just started using this week is called medium.com, um, which, you know, is a user generated website. But then you're going to have websites like Craigslist and Backpage to just get out of the business of trying to create a better experience. No, I mean, th there are better ways to go against this goal. Craigslist got so much public pressure that it effectively started getting rid of some of its categories that were geared towards prostitution. Uh, there's still a lot of ways to go there, but uh, the solution is not just to uh, you know, go after Backpage and destroy the whole internet with them. I'm wondering okay. if there's some sort of middle ground uh, in this, because we're we're framing our discussion here as if this is a we have exactly two choices: either have robust immunity with Section 230, which allows platforms to be totally uh, involved if they want to, or totally hands off. You know, it's just you know totally uh, immunizing them from liability. And Section 230, incidentally, does not use the word immunity. And here in the Seventh Circuit, it's unclear whether it really is immunity. If you read the 2003 decision by Judge Easterbrook in Doe versus GTE, he thinks it's actually Section... Anyway, I don't want to get too erudite on this, but <laughs> immunity is not a foregone conclusion everywhere in the, in the United States. But, you know, if you look back to the case that you've mentioned, uh, Derek, a couple of times, you know, the Stratton Oakmont case from New York back in the mid-90s, which really was the catalyst for Section 230, what the court held in that in this case was that a website could be liable if it had notice of the uh, tortious content and failed to act. Um, so you know, with that, you know, that's, that's really the, the standard here that existed before Section 230. And incidentally, it's the standard that applies in the brick and mortar world. If a bookstore for example, is put on notice that it has a defamatory book on its shelf, it can be held liable, even though that is third-party content. So Section 230 is a clear example of internet exceptionalism. Congress stepped in and said, wait, the internet is different, so we need to implement a different kind of law here. The middle ground that I see in all this takes into account, you know, that broad sweeping perspective, historical, uh, you know, what the world was like in 1994, 1995 with the Stratton Oakmont case. And then the, you know, decades of case law that developed for defamation in the brick and mortar world about a, 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 a intermediary being put on notice and the, the tort, tort liability coming into effect at that moment of, of notice and then all the way to the, the broad, really extreme, um, you know, immunity where service providers can do whatever they want because Section 230 protects them and even, you know, protects scoundrels like Hunter Moore. I mean, is there the, the middle ground? Wouldn't that be just exactly what we had before? There is no liability uh, unless, and so there is immunity. The baseline is immunity, unlike the, the rest of the world. But if the site is put on notice at that point, and this notice would be something very formal, like the DMCA, uh, Section 512, where it actually requires certain measures to be met, you know, if it is put on notice of this horribly tortious conduct going on, and it doesn't do anything about it, it loses that immunity. It doesn't mean it's automatically liable, but it, it actually does have to do something. And, and if it chooses not to do it, if it chooses to disregard somebody being harmed, day in and day out because of uh, a third party's tortious content, then it runs the risk of, of liability. Would that break the internet? No, the idea of you know, actual knowledge being the requirement um, is not outside the realm of possibility. But that case that I cited was just one case because I didn't want to get in the weeds because there have been other cases that have said that there is such a thing as constructive knowledge that you knew or should have known. The more that you were involved in a website, the more that you are policing the website, uh, the more liable you are. And even with the law as it is today, there are some areas where websites are held liable if they are, you know, kind of too involved with some of these processes. Um, you know, a classic example was, um, uh, I think it was with a, a roommate selection yep. website where you choose your roommates and they allowed for users to say that they were looking for a roommate that was straight or, or gay I forgot exactly all the categories. I think it was. But I think it was racial as well. Okay, sorry, it was it, it was racial. My my mistake. Um, and uh, you know that was an example where they were found to help facilitate um, that that racial discrimination. Yeah. Um, so there's there's already a little bit of that, but there certainly could be middle grounds here. Um, you know, in the example of 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 uh, copyright issues. 
um, which is dealt with through the DMCA, uh, Section 512 of that. Um, so not under this, but um, you know, you're generally not liable for when somebody puts something up on YouTube, um, but you do have that takedown process. But there's one other thing that does help the content creators, which is that if you're if you're deliberately involved in the process, I forgot the exact words of the language, but you have the you know the um, you know the, the Kazaa case, presumably Pirate Bay. If it was in the United States, it would be deemed to be one of these websites that it does have user generated uh, pro, uh, stuff. And even if it abided by the DMCA takedown process, it's not really enough because it's kind of catering an environment deliberately right. designed for piracy. So similarly, you can make an argument here. You know, if Craigslist has a you know a category that says you know underage uh, uh, prostitutes here, um, that that would presumably open them to liability. Um, so there are there are middle grounds here. All right, I have uh, three things to contribute. Number one, this same wacky laws list that I pulled up, Evan. It's at divinecaroline.com. I'll add it to our discussion points at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 228, where you'll find the uh, wonderful pieces by Derek that we've been discussing as well as all our other discussion points for this show. In Illinois, supposedly, it's illegal to take a French poodle to the opera in Chicago. Oh, so man, I've to totally got to change my plans for tonight. <laughs> I am stressed now. <laughs> yes. So check on that one to fact check them, see if they're right. Uh, also, we're going to make our first MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law, two words uh, in honor of our discussion here. And uh, finally, Derek, before we move on to other things, I'd like to know uh, if you can bring us up to speed. We know that this discussion and debate is going on in Washington, but where logistically do things stand well, you know, there was some chatter about the uh, attorney generals making this move. Uh, obviously, the letter came out, um, I think it was uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so there's really going to, it's an open question. I, I would expect Congress to have a hearing on this. That hasn't been confirmed, but that's just my suspicion. Generally, when 47 attorney generals request congressional action, it's something that they take very seriously. Um, so I don't know if they're going to legislate, but I, I would assume that they'd have a hearing on this topic through the Judiciary Committee process. All right. Well, we know uh, that those things happen all the time and some happened this week, at least events in Washington where people were lobbying for various outcomes happened. Uh, and those involve the entertainment industry. So let's go over to there and talk about them. So the MPAA and the RIAA have long uh, fought against pirate-oriented activities online. And uh, right now they've got, you know, they've long had YouTube in their sites. Now they're targeting Google search. Uh, and as I mentioned, there was an event in Washington this last week. What is this, like a press conference? Do, do they, you know, take down a hotel ballroom? Uh, Derek, how does this logistically happen? Do they, do they actually go to the Capitol building to do these kinds of things? It wasn't a hearing. Yes, um, I wasn't actually at the event, but I think that they mm -hmm. rented out a, a, a room in the Capitol complex uh, mm -hmm. Many times, uh, kind of connected lobby groups are able to rent out a room either in the um, the Capitol building or the area where the staffers work. Uh, so that's my understanding is that they had an event within the heart of the Capitol uh, where they right. presented their evidence of the cost of piracy. Uh, and it actually had a, a pre by CCIA kind of disputing all their evidence. So uh, a lot going on here on the on that front. A pre -buttle. That's pretty clever. A pre Yes, um, but the, the upshot of it was that the MPAA is not happy with the fact that you can still use Google to find a whole lot of infringing stuff online. They think that Google is not doing a good enough job of taking infringing links out of search results. Um, and, you know, I again, I mean, this very closely relates to what we were just discussing because now we've moved over to the DMCA and out of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, but Google has cover for its search results uh, because if there are infringing sites that it is pointing to, uh, the, 
the rights holders in those cases can write to Google and ask that the links to those sites be taken down. And in fact, many, many people do pursue that route. And uh, as another form of pre-buttle or rebuttal, I'm not quite sure how the timing worked on all this. Um, Fred Von Lohman posted something up on Google's policy blog and a report uh, basically talking about the steps that Google takes to um, combat privacy and infringement um, and going into some detail over uh, the volume of those kinds of requests that they get and the fact that uh, I think one of the tidbits Fred put in there was uh, on average they're able to remove links when given notice in this way within six hours of them being submitted. And that's despite the fact that the volume of notices has increased exponentially over time. So uh, Google thinks it's doing a pretty good job. The MPAA thinks they could be doing better. Uh, Derek, where do you think this is all going to shake out? Well, it's, it's kind of funny as, you know, you have the traditional players in the room, the MPA saying that piracy is, you know, the end of, of everything and it's costing us billions of dollars. Google saying that we're doing everything we possibly can do here. And the voices that really aren't in the room are really the actual patterns that, that are happening with content and these DMCA takedown processes. So the MPA has automated processes to send millions and millions of filings for takedowns. And their definition of what is infringing is um, usually very different from what a court would actually hold. Uh, so there's really a third party in the room, which is legitimate content that's kind of swept up in this mass mm -hmm. dragnet um, that's going on. I think there's no question that Google could be doing more. Google's certainly trying to do more. Um, you know, you search for any movie and search torrent. Um, that's generally not going to be a legitimate link. Um, but it's, you know, the, the, the a number, the amount of, of effort involved here is pretty monumental. I think I said 15, 15-fold uh, 15 increases in requests since 2011 um, is what they're dealing with. And uh, there's a new report that came out that showed that um, even when, when Google gets rid of um, all piracy links, um, it really has no impact upon whether or not those um, those searchers actually find the pirated works they're looking for. So the evidence suggests that it's it's not that somebody says, I want to watch Game of Thrones tonight. Oh, I just searched for it on Google and I found a free link. I'm going to watch it for free. The evidence suggests that users say, I want to watch Game of Thrones and I don't want to pay for it. And uh, they go about finding a way to get that content for free, which we all know is relatively easy uh, to procure. Right. So, Evan... Where do we go from here? Uh, it seems to me like there are some censorship, as as Derek was saying, some issues about um, sites that are legitimate getting swept up in any kind of effort to filter out infringing results. Uh, Google already has safe search for concerned parents. Uh, maybe they need an infringement-free search option, perhaps. Well, wouldn't that be a shame, really? I mean, I don't know what the MPAA really is, wants here, what it's, what it's really asking for. I mean, we've got the DMCA. You know, Google has to, if it wants to sail its ship in the safe harbor, Section 512, it, as a information location tool, has to comply with uh, notice uh, notices of, of infringement that show up in, in the index. And so the MPAA seems to just be unhappy with the very standard that it lobbied in 1980. In 1998 to get in uh, the DMCA, you know, to have this notice and take down uh, system here. So I guess it's because it's Google and Google has risen to such prominence and is, you know, so closely akin to a common carrier or and there should be, you know, imbued with that sort of public responsibility that the MPAA can kind of get by with making this sort of argument that what Google is doing is is not enough. But I really don't get it, and I don't see how it, it uh, meshes with the standard that's already there that with the DMCA that, that we all know big content got pushed through in, in the late 90s. Another kind of funny thing about this, and, and I think this is what you were saying, Derek, a, a kind of a variation of this, you know, re the real infringement going on on the internet is not going on on the web. It's, you know, through, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, other ways, other mechanisms that don't show 
show up in the you know the the, the live web that actually a search engine will reach uh, in the first place. I read an article recently, and 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 I should have brought it up for for our discussion today, but it was it was a very good article. You know, being concerned about infringement on the web is a little bit like the old joke of the cop who's notices the drunk guy looking for his keys under the street lamp. Uh, and he goes, the cop goes and asks him, why are you looking for your keys under the street lamp? He says, well, I can't see anywhere else. So, you know, the, <laughs> the keys could have been anywhere. That's kind of what's going on here. Being so focused on infringement on the web misses the real import of this, uh, the, of, of the piracy that's going on in the world. And, and this just seems to be another iteration of that. Uh, notwithstanding the issues that I was raising at first with, you know, the big content being unhappy with the very standard that it uh, tried or that it successfully did get uh, made into law in the late 90s. So I, I right. So I, go ahead, Derek. Sorry. I guess what I mean is, you know, there's more that Google could do, but, you know, what, what they could do that the MPA kind of wants them to do is more um, kind of computer-related algorithms, which by definition would have things get stuck in the dragnet. So, you know, when you search torrent, a whole bunch of stuff comes up. And is the solution for Google to just get rid of everything that has torrent? Well, of course not. Torrenting is a unbelievably incredible technology that can be used for good or for bad. Uh, and so we know there's a lot of legitimate content that's on torrent. So you don't want to just get rid of these, you know, these, these markers and on YouTube, we've seen that, you know, a whole bunch of these videos have been taken down that are really fair use. Um, and oftentimes Google complies. Google will take it down. Um, so we, we already have kind of seen the damage of excessive takedown requests. Um, and, 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 and we don't really, the data doesn't really corroborate a benefit from even more. And so it almost seems like it's missing the real problem. Um, you know, I, I added recently to the, the list, um, the, the comments, um, what was it? Uh, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey's comments um, when he was, I think it was in the UK, he just got accepted a reward about uh, for House of Cards. And he basically uh, gave a, a pretty significant speech, I thought, uh, about three minutes on the specific topic of if you give people what they want in a fashion that they want to watch it in, and you don't create too much gimmicks and you let them watch it whenever they want to access it, they are more often than not going to pay for that content rather than steal it. And that's what the data of House of Cards shows and a lot of these other shows. So there's been a lot of real you know, uh, technological solutions trying to really understand how you know, to innovate away from this problem, um, which kind of reminds me of the comments of the MPA in the 1980s when they said that the VCR was... Uh, to the movie industry with the Boston Strangler is to Boston women. And then four years after Jack Valenti tried to ban the VCR, um, they actually made more money from videotape cassettes. Uh, and today, of course, that's an $18 billion industry, the, you know, the consumer market that they tried to ban. So the solution is really to kind of uh, recognize that there are some technical limitations and figure out what consumers want and offer it. I wanted to hone in, Derek, if I could, on something you mentioned a few minutes ago, and that was a study that someone <laughs> cited in this discussion uh, saying that even if you take search out of the equation, uh, people are able to find whatever infringing material they like. Um, do you know, did the study talk about how that's being done? Is it just a factor of... Uh, what Evan raised, that it's not actually happening through search, that uh, if you're using BitTorrent as your means of infringement, that search isn't involved really in that process anyway. Uh, why is why is search not relevant? Well, I, I wish I had the study at my fingertips. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to, you know, completely uh, ascertain its veracity, but it does kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there are a relatively small percentage of the American people that are really responsible for, you know, 90 percent of the piracy. So if that's true, then you would think that those people who are downloading quite a lot, they know exactly where to look. Uh, and so they're going to go to, you know, whatever their favorite uh, torrent website is or other peer-to-peer -peer technology, and they're going to use it. They're not going to just jump on Google and, and search blindly for you know, free copy of Game of Thrones because that's not a very effective way of finding uh, pirated content. So if you know what you're doing, 
It's actually there, there are smarter ways to go about that end goal if that is your end goal. So it kind of conceptually makes sense. Right. I see what you're saying. Um, the other thing that occurred to me while the discussion was going on is although the MPAA may like uh, Google making a change to its algorithm, algorithm that simply would not display search results for anything that involved the word torrent, that's sort of leaving aside the fact that torrent has been an English term for quite some time before the actual technology of torrenting came along. And so you're going to, you know, basically take down uh, and make invisible to search anything that involves huge rushing floods of water or other <laughs> ways in which torrent might come up. Absolutely. I actually found the uh, study. It was put out by CCIA and uh, it, it said targeting search engines as a means of combating online piracy is not the best strategy for the content industry. Um, so that was the, the study that came out that pre-butted the MPAA's findings. Uh, so I'll, I'll post that up on the uh, IRC channel for everybody to check out. All right. Just because I love the word so much and have never actually heard it before, let's make pre buttle our second MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. If you're listening to the show for continuing legal education credit, uh, congratulations. We're glad you're doing that. Head on over to our Twit Wiki at wiki.twit.tv and there's information for each of the U.S. jurisdictions on how you can go about uh, submitting uh, for approval of that credit. Um, also, sometimes people in other professions listen to the show for professional credit too. So kudos to you. We put these words into the show in case you have to demonstrate to some oversight body that you actually listened. So this is our little check on that. Uh, some interesting news and good news for Pandora subscribers. Uh, Pandora has had a lawsuit going on uh, and still has a lawsuit going on with ASCAP uh, in that lawsuit. And I'm not quite sh very up on the logistical um, what's going on here, uh, but there was a determination by a district court in New York um, that is an interim ruling that's a good thing for Pandora. Um, apparently various music publishers have been trying to withdraw from uh, having their rates negotiated by ASCAP uh, and negotiate directly with web radio providers um, so that they can get better rates. Uh, the court, going back to a 1941 consent decree that governs ASCAP, has basically said, no, that's not gonna fly and the new media licensing rights uh, that ASCAP administers are going to remain in place. Um, this is good news for the time being for Pandora, but this lawsuit continues um, and they're going to get into the question of what those fees should be. Uh, it sounds like later on this year. So uh, just a note that there was this development and, and ASCAP got a bit of a stock bump out of it, I think. Evan, have you been following this at all? I haven't been following it, but it is interesting to see how a 1941 consent decree could uh, affect new media rights uh, today. I mean, it, I mean, once you get behind it, it doesn't, uh, it's not that mystifying, but, you know, because it has to do with ASCAP and, you know, it really is an important gatekeeper when it comes to all this. And so the court essentially was, or the court found essentially that uh, ASCAP was doing more than what it was authorized to do under that consent decree to make works available. So it clearly is an important uh, ruling for Pandora apart from uh, just the fact that they happen to win, you know, in this particular thing here. I mean, it sets the uh, the the more uh, general tone of uh, you know the the recognition that ASCAP is under this obligation to make works available, regardless of the medium, even if it's something that uh, the uh, the record companies are perhaps a bit fearful. Uh, the controversy about uh, fair remuneration for um, streaming uh, is not new, uh, but this certainly. You know, is a decision that goes in to that favor of more availability and uh, will give some more breathing room for the actual amounts to uh, to be determined. So it's good for when it comes to the availability of music, obviously. Yeah, we had more on this dispute. I don't know the episode of This Week in Law, but it's the one uh, in which we discussed, Paul Williams, I believe is the 
head of ASCAP. They are the songwriters. Um, so they're the ones, the driving force here, um, trying to argue that their fees are not high enough from web radio providers such as Pandora. Uh, any thoughts on this, Derek? Uh, no, I mean, th this whole process is pretty unbelievable. I'm a free market guy, and the idea that this is somehow a free market negotiation when you have this ASCAP board, it's just, it's, it's really a farce. Um, and you have, you know, one or two of these artists that are really able to kind of drag down the whole process like Metallica, who won't license any of their work to be streamed online. And it really is just, it's hurting the end consumer. Um, and it doesn't, it really doesn't make that much sense. All right. Well, uh, let us move on having visited with Pandora uh, and Talk a bit about, well, first of all, before we get into, we've got some um, more on fingerprint security with the iPhone 5S. Uh, we cannot have Derek on the show without talking about cell phone unlocking. So we're going to get into that uh, as well as uh, possibly some privacy stories. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, which is ProXPN. ProXPN, of course, is a global VPN, virtual private network, that works with almost any internet connection. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with ProXPN, including your web browser, your email, file sharing, and instant messaging programs. ProXPN keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, disguising your physical location, and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. So as Derek was mentioning earlier, there are a myriad of very legitimate ways that people use BitTorrent. BitTorrent itself certainly is distancing itself from any piracy-oriented activity uh, that the service may be associated with in people's minds. Um, if you're someone who uses uh, P2P to transfer files around, share them around, it's a very efficient way of getting large files uh, into other people's hands. Um, ProXPN is going to make sure that that continues working for you, even if you happen to be in a place where that kind of activity is being throttled over concerns over privacy and infringement and the like. So the way it works is there's a complete online uh, privacy made available to you through 500 through a 512-bit encryption tunnel. It works via OpenVPN or PPTP. You get to choose. You protect yourself against your ISP's six-strike rule. Again, if you're someone engaged in perfectly legitimate activity, there is no need to put a lot of speed bumps in front of you if your activity happens to trigger uh, the attention of your ISP, you're not gonna have to worry about that if you're using uh, ProXPN. You can keep your personal internet usage private while you're at work. You can bypass internet filtering and blocked websites, bypass geographical restrictions for internet content and online video with worldwide servers in the US, UK, Asia, and more. It makes your internet connection region free and its software for Windows and Mac offers advanced controls, allowing you to select the programs and ports you want to anonymously route through ProXPN servers. ProXPN also works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public or corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. And there's a new ProXPN app for Android in the Google Play Store that supports OpenVPN. There's world-class customer support, Steve Gibson loves this product and uh, over there on Security Now, his wonderful show, if you go to episode 400, he gives all the details of how it works and why it works well. And so if you want to give it a try yourself, the way to do that is to go to proxpn.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are usually $9.95 a month or $74.95 for the entire year. But don't pay that. We've got a much better deal for you. If you use the code TWILL, you'll get 20% off the lifetime of your account. That's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days and you'll get a full refund. So go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign up with the code TWILL, T-W-I-L, 
Thank you so much, ProXPN, for your support of This Week in Law. All righty, let us move on to uh, fingerprint security and the issue that we discussed last week about uh, whether or not this is going to mean that you're waiving your Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, If you have things on your phone, whether or not you can be compelled by law enforcement if you're in custody, for example, to go ahead and fork over your finger uh, so that they can take a look at what's on your phone. Marsha Hoffman has an essay on this over at Wired Magazine, or not Wired Magazine, Wired.com. Tells you, we're, we were talking to, uh, before the show about uh, the IRC channel we have and how we'd just taken a trip back to the 90s. Of course, Wired Magazine is still a great magazine, but uh, its online uh, material is daily and uh, up to date. And so is Marsha Hoffman's essay over there. Uh, and so... Evan, where do you think uh, we stand with this now? I know we talked about it a lot last week. Mm -hmm. Well, we stand at a really interesting uh, juncture uh, on this. Marsha's piece on Wired.com does a good job of explaining how the Fifth Amendment protects uh, testimony. Uh, the, The government can't compel you to testify as to something that's going to be uh, self-incriminating. And that distinction, uh, well, the the distinction between things that are testimony and which are not testimony really essentially falls on the line of whether or not it's getting at something that you're thinking about, your thoughts, what's going on inside your head. And uh, there's also an interesting reference in the article about how this is based in English law from the 1600s that actually to combat forced confessions under torture. So, you know, there, it's interesting to see how that vestige is still in our, in our law today. Very important, obviously, for a civilized uh, society. So, you know, what, what makes this really interesting is how it sets up, I think, issues that are going to come in the future. It's, it's what we have here is the question of whether or not if the government were to force you to, to use your fingerprint to unlock a device and thereby make available evidence to the government, whether that is a... Uh, that whether that is forced testimony. And it seems like it's not. You know, the biometric uh, data is there. There's nothing that's getting at the contents of your mind to figure out what this is. So that's how it's unlike a uh, password or passphrase or some other encryption key to, uh, decryption key to get at information that's not available. So it's interesting to think of it in this context right here with the iPhone 5S it's even more interesting to think about it in the future when uh, someday, conceivably, there will be technology that will be able to essentially read other people's minds. You know, you hold up a wand or a scanner to someone's brain and thereby get the information that they know to authenticate themselves and their access to information. That's when it could really get tricky for us is, you know, is what, what kind of protection does the Fifth Amendment afford us for that? Because, you know, we're not voluntarily giving over that information. It's not a testimony that you're giving, but it's being taken from you essentially as biometric data. You know, what is the real difference uh, between the you know the 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 signatures of the magnetic and electronic information electronic information going on in your brain how is that any different than the pattern of the prints uh, on your hand so very uh, interesting juncture here and we can easily extrapolate where this technology may go and that's where it could really get to be some interesting issues someday uh, doesn't seem like the fifth amendment is well positioned to give us a whole lot of protection when uh, those uh, methods of acquiring information become more refined and more powerful okay i'm officially canceling your subscription to all of those singularity related blogs and newsletters that you subscribe to evan you just blew my mind with that one the (laughs) the the mind reading wand that we have to look forward to here Uh, it seems to me if i'm someone like ace criminal defense lawyer saul goodman i'm going to make the argument that it depends what's on the device You know, there are going to be some things on your phone that are non-testimonial in nature, and there are going to be some things on your phone that are. If you're taking a lot of notes, if you have documents on there um, that are, you know, basically laying out your plan to carry out whatever nefarious scheme you're involved in, 
um, that that would be testimonial, wouldn't you think? Well, I don't know that it's the contents that you would be looking at to see whether it's testimonial. The, the, the issue of whether it's testimonial and thereby covered under the Fifth Amendment comes in the act of getting at the information. Now, maybe what you're thinking about, Denise, would be more appropriately considered a Fourth Amendment issue, you know, whether or mm -hmm. not the warrant that was issued in order to allow the cops to come in and, you know, get this biometric data from you and, and go in there, whether or not that uh, was supported uh, you know, whether, whether or not the affidavit swearing out that warrant was supported by the knowledge of the police and what they expected to get there. So I don't know that the contents, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to dispute you. I'm just trying to discuss this. I'm not sure that the, I, I don't see necessarily how the contents of the phone would be relevant to the analysis of whether or not it's a fifth amendment violation to, you know, to, to uh, get at it in the first place. Cause the, whether or not it's a, whether or not it's testimony goes to that act of just you know, opening up the, the door so that it can be seen. Okay. Uh, Derek, what do you think? Well, if I can jump in there for a second. So, I mean, case law is kind of muddled across the board on, you know, whether or not you can require people to provide passwords. It's something that the courts are starting to come to a grasp with and starting to become a little bit more clear. But what is clear is courts can usually compel you to, you know, provide a password in order to access a device. They're pretty uncomfortable with it. Um, for a bunch of reasons, one of which is you can just say, I forgot, and then they're going to have to judge if you are showing contempt for the court or if you have legitimately forgotten the password. Um, and if you, let's say, encrypted a hard drive from three years ago, uh, it's very possible that you legitimately did forget. Um, but where the court has really stepped in and said something is testimonial relating to this is there was a, a case, I'm trying to remember the name of it, I don't have it offhand, but the police had almost no idea what they were looking for. They thought that there was incriminating information in this hard drive, but they didn't even know um, which partition it was on. They didn't even know anything about the actual hard drive. And so the court said that providing the password was itself testimonial um, because it would, it would provide um, the existence of a partition on the hard drive that the police themselves did not know actually existed. Uh, but the idea of providing a key to a locked door is, is, of course, not testimonial, as Evan was saying. So there's nothing all that surprising about this, you know, the Wired article. I thought it was spot on. Um, you know, this issue can be dealt with through Congress. Um, not everything has to be a Fifth Amendment issue. If we're uncomfortable with you being required to unlock your phone through fingerprint, Congress can easily pass the law and say that you can't comp be compelled to do so. That's an excellent point. Uh, getting back to our discussion last week where we started having gruesome flashbacks to science fiction movies like Minority Report and Species, where people's limbs were being severed to gain access to things, uh, apparently that's not going to be possible or productive in the case of the iPhone 5S as reported uh, by Adario Strange at Mashable. Uh, Evan, why is that? Well, you know, the, actually the explanation wasn't all that satisfactory to me in this uh, article here. And how do you like the name of Dario Strange? Isn't that great? We got we to talk to that yeah. guy. Uh -huh. um, it was essentially the subcontractor who provided the technology saying, well, you know, you actually have to be alive because it reads the subdural, subdermal, epidural, epi, not epidural. Oh. What is it? Sub <laughs> epidermal. <laughs> Subdermal? <laughs> Something like that. Underneath your skin. <laughs> Talk about getting under your skin, this whole conversation is. So, yeah. you know, it just said essentially, well, you know, that won't work. I trust it has something to do with, uh, you know, other factors like, you know, it actually being living tissue so that it, it gets to a certain level. Uh, but I guess it's reassuring to hear something. But I think we talked about this last week. You've really got to take this stuff with a grain mm -hmm. of salt. Uh, what Apple says about things like security, because we've been fooled in the past as to what our expectation of, of privacy should be when it comes to information that, that Apple is gathering and, and storing. So at least it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> Uh, Derek, we didn't uh, have you on last week when we were first talking about fingerprint security. What are your general thoughts about it? Well, you know, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I do know that if a cat can uh, lock his phone with his fingerprint and unlock it with his <laughs> fingerprint, I'm not exactly confident 
in this, you know, alive, not alive distinction being really all that difficult. I think I've watched uh, plenty of science fiction movies where they have something along those lines and they, they find a way around it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it has to be a fingerprint that emits heat. And then they, you know, create a little glove and or they have the guy put on something on his finger, you know, like a, a little sheath, like a glove on his finger. Um, so I guess we'll see. Um, but you know, the reality is that that's better than where we are now because, you know, right now it's a, f- a four-digit password, which is pretty easy to guess. Um, usually most people have it be a pretty easy password, and that password's actually kept somewhere on the iPhone. So, uh, you know, if, if they have to cut your finger off to access your iPhone, I guess we're in a little better place than being able to access it on the phone itself. Oh, wow. <laughs> From a security <laughs> perspective. <laughs> right. Better to get your finger cut off under any set of circumstances, right? Well, I, I forget. I think you retweeted this from someone, Evan, and whoever that person said what, was, let's just make sure the criminals know that yeah. <laughs> experts say slicing off your finger is is not going to be effective. Right. Well, the, 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 worst, the worst case scenario is a criminal doesn't know. Cuts right. off your finger and then says, oh, that one oh. didn't work. Darn <laughs> and it. Then keep on going. <laughs> that is the worst case scenario. So I agree with you. Yes. And let's let's just hope they don't try, you know, cycling through all 10 to see if they hit the lottery there. Can we talk about something else? Yeah, yeah. Let's all talk right. about something else. Fine, fine. Um, let's talk about cell phones and unlocking them. Uh, and the fact that locking them should now officially be illegal. Should it not, Derek? Uh, absolutely not. Um for, for those who are relatively newer listeners, uh, Evan and I had a, a bit of a heated dispute on this uh, several months ago uh, on the topic of cell phone unlocking. So uh, in October... Wait, wait. Before we talk about the legislation itself, I cannot deprive our audience of the bumper that I forgot to cue just now as we get into our discussion of legislation and policy. <laughs> oh, I thought you just played this for me. I didn't realize this for our audience. It's just me, so I can get my groove on. And Evan as well. All right. So we, Derek, you you very ardently and turns out successfully uh, campaigned for new legislation that legalizes cell phone unlocking. I apologize if I stumbled over saying that earlier. Legalizing unlocking. Does, does that mean that locking it is now illegal? Is the converse true? Um, no, the, there, there are two bills that have been, well, sorry, there have been a whole bunch of bills that have been introduced, mm-hmm. um, but none of the legislations w- would make locking it actually illegal. The legislation okay. we're dealing with here is only to say that consumers should be able to unlock their devices uh, without committing a felony, punishable by five years in prison and half a million dollar fine. So, you know, providers can still lock it down and make it difficult for consumers, but um, it, it, it still needs to be lawful. All right. And and now we have the current presidential administration urging the FCC to require carriers to unlock their devices, I assume, at users' request. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And it applies both to the user and also to the successor of the phone. So if you sell it to somebody else, they inherit that right per se. Okay. So um, if you are purchasing a locked phone, which can legally be locked, as long as you ask to have it unlocked, uh, they don't have to unlock it for you now, but that's what the administration would like to see happen. Yes, that was with the NTIA. Um, they're a division of the Commerce Department representing the administration. The NTIA's mm-hmm. petition to the FCC was specifically requesting that mandate. Uh, now, the mm-hmm. FCC hasn't ruled on this issue, uh, so it's very unclear where they may end up on it. So it's it's kind of a um, I, I liken it to a very positive step to push the ball forward. But we're really still hoping for Congress to take action. But this puts highlight on the issue all over again. Uh, we we think that there may be some members in the FCC who are very skeptical of the FCC mandating this um, when the problem is really created by Congress. And there's some kind of jurisdictional. Uh, you know, does the FCC have authority questions that could come up that are just much more clean if Congress doesn't? Well, what would a congressional fix look like? Would they have to amend the law that just passed? Um, So I'm sorry, there's been no law that has passed on unlocking. 
the right. Chairman Goodlatte unlocking bill passed the House committee. Uh, gotcha. So it still has to be passed by the House and Senate. Uh, so, you know, the, it's preferable for everybody, for Congress to be serious about this and just pass the bill that now has bipartisan support and has, you know, engaged 114,000 Americans, but also a whole bunch of other you know, groups on the left and the right who really know these issues cold. And even the wireless industries, the industries that had petitioned the Librarian of Congress to make it illegal, now support the bill. So at this gotcha. point, there really is no excuse for Congress not to act. I see. So we're still waiting on Congress to act. And there's actually, it sounds like a danger that if the FCC acts first, Congress may feel like it doesn't need to. I mean, that's entirely possible. Uh, you know, when I worked in Congress, I saw quite often that uh, many times people in Congress were hoping for somebody else to take these decisions off the table for them. But that really would not be the most appropriate situation here because it would deny Congress the opportunity to really review all the ancillary issues that are at hand here. So this may deal with unlocking, perhaps, but we have 18 million jailbroken devices in this country, and jailbreaking is in a similar category. Now, jailbreaking was illegal last year. It's legal this year for an iPhone. It's illegal for an iPad. Uh, and in another three years, that could all go up again. Well, that doesn't make that much sense. Uh, you know, Before January, 18 million Americans were felons. Those issues should also be debated on the record. Um, and, you know, accessibility technology for persons who are blind and deaf. You know, I've talked quite a bit on previous episodes, so I don't want to drone on. But these issues should be debated on the record. And if Congress thinks that it's perfectly appropriate to take away technology that would help people who are blind, that's fine. Uh, but they should testify to that effect. And um, I would probably lead a campaign to, to get them out of office. Evan, uh, what do you think? Do you think that uh, this congressional effort is going to stall at this point or or do you think it has enough momentum to continue i would look to derek to see what's going to happen on that you know he's got the that got the insight on what congress is actually likely to do um you know derek i think you ought to be commended for you know leading an effort to really get it this far you know certainly when i think about this issue i think of you and what you've done and you know to get the obama administration to actually even recognize it as an issue i mean clearly with 100 and what was 114,000 signatures to a petition. There's there's going to be some response to this. I guess you know the real uh, cynicism, or I'll you know maybe be a little bit easier on myself. You know the the skepticism that I've always felt about this is whether or not it's overstating a problem and thereby running the risk of harming consumers. And you know if if the if the economics pan out. And it's actually better for the marketplace for consumers to have more choice when it comes to this, which I see it necessarily as being to the detriment of the providers here. Then, you know, if the economics bear out, you know, I'm convinced that it's uh, it's a good thing. Uh, so, you know, and it sounds to to me, Derek, you know, as as you're reporting, if even the wireless industry itself is coming around to to see it this way, then you know, what is there really to to talk about? And I would say, you know. Good, good work. It's um, you know, it's glad to see that there's uh, there's progress on the, on this issue. Is there well, kind of then, a par is there kind of a parallel here, Derek, to to the entertainment industry uh, realizing that consumers really want, as Kevin Spacey said, to be able to watch what they want when they want to watch it on the device they want to watch it, and they're going to be willing to pay for that privilege. Is there a parallel here to, to the wireless industry starting to uh, come to an understanding that consumers want this flexibility with their devices? Well, I mean, that's the, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Evan for his you know, gracious compliment. Uh, but the, the nice version of the story is that the cell phone providers came to their senses and realized that you know, their consumers really want this flexibility. Their consumers really don't want to be arrested for this. Uh, but the more cynical perspective, the perspective I think is actually accurate here, is um, you know they, they realized that it was really an indefensible position that they were arguing. Um, so I don't think that the market, the, the, the major companies themselves have actually changed or, you know, for example, these phones are still being sold locked. Uh, they're not selling them unlocked for the most part. There are one or two providers that are selling them unlocked, but they weren't the ones who were pushing for this prohibition. So if there really was a change of hearts, then perhaps they would be selling them unlocked. 
But to Evan's point, um, you know, I believe it's a lot more than just the end consumer that benefits here. Um, you know, in my testimony before Congress, I provided a number of examples on how this actually leads to more competition in the market. So the, the, uh, the main uh, opponent to the Librarian of Congress was the Competitive Carriers Association. They represent over 100 carriers. And so what really happened here was that the big wireless carriers, AT&T and Verizon in particular, they try to make the technology illegal when all these smaller wireless carriers, including Sprint and T-Mobile on down, they, didn't, they wanted the technology to be lawful because they saw it as a pro-competitive policy. Uh, I included comments from Republic Wireless, which is a brand new uh, phone carrier that offers unlimited voice, unlimited text, unlimited internet for $19 a month. And their catch is that they have a system that runs on Wi-Fi for calls or runs on Sprint, depending on what area you're on. That lets them have that really low, aggressive price point. But they provided testimony, or they provided comments in my testimony, that their biggest impediment to growth is that they aren't able to have the state-of-the-art phones. And the biggest single change would be to allow their consumers, once their contract has expired, to bring that iPhone or that Droid over to their service, that it would be a game changer for their economic, mar their market model. And uh, obviously we shouldn't be subsidizing one market model over another, but this is just how the free market would naturally play out. So I think the impact is quite substantial there, which is why, you know, Ajit Pai, who's the Republican appointment to the FCC, he's all about the free market. He said, this is very simple. Let's restore the free market, which will lead to incredible mobile growth. Would, would you necessarily have to wait until your contract expires to uh, use a phone with a service like that if this law passes? Shouldn't you be able to just buy an unlocked phone and not have to deal with one of the major car carrier's contracts at all? Well, the good lap bill says that unlocking your phone is never a crime. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, well... It's a little more complicated than that because it allows the Librarian of Congress to rule on this all over again in three years, which is why there's actually a preferable bill, but that's a little bit in the weeds. But it, it, it says that you can unlock your phone whether you're in contract or whether you're out of contract. But the difference is that if you're in contract, unlocking your phone may be a contractual violation. You may owe that provider an early termination fee. And that's mm -hmm. not, you know, we're, we're not trying to vitiate that, co you know, that contractual arrangement here. Um, so that's still going to exist um, under under all the provisions, under the FCC proposal or any of the bills. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know if it's possible to buy, you know, one of the, as you were saying, Derek, the top tier phones, is it possible to just buy one without a contract? If you're buying an iPhone and they ship it to you uh, from Apple, you don't have to pick a carrier, do you? Well, that's that's right. Uh, but uh, you know, you can buy a new iPhone today. I think it's two hundred dollars or one hundred fifty dollars with subsidization, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to buy it unsub unsubsidized, I think that the list price is around six fifty or seven hundred dollars. Ah. Uh, so consumers are going to be very unlikely to buy those unsubsidized phones. So the real issue is, can you buy a subsidized phone and then uh, you know, once your contract has expired, are you just going to throw it away, or can you use it on a new provider if you wanted? Um, you know, right now everyone wants the latest and greatest phone, but I think we can all imagine, you know, five years from now when a phone that's two years old is essentially good enough or three years old is essentially good enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're really nearing that point and that's going to allow for real phone portability, just like we have number portability. So you have one phone number and you can take it with you for your whole life. Yeah, that's a, these are aspects of this I had not thought about before. So we appreciate you fleshing that out. Evan, uh, any thoughts about this at all? No, no. I, the, I'm just excited to see it continue on. Yep. Good stuff. So we will, we will keep an eye. Is, uh, is there anything that people can still do to encourage Congress to take the actions that it needs to take, Derek? Well, I, I would recommend that people reach out to the member of Congress. There's really two proposals here. There's the Good Lap Bill, which is set, effectively says, let's let the librarian rule on this issue all over again. Uh, and so it would allow consumers to unlock their phones uh, for another few years, but then it would kick it back to the Librarian of Congress, who has already said that he stands by his ruling. 
So I really can't imagine a more dangerous situation for innovation. I mean, imagine if you're trying to get money from a venture capitalist and you say, well, I have this great business, but it may be illegal in two years. We just don't know. Um, so that's that's problematic. But the other bill that's, that spreads better is um, the uh, massey Lufgren um, eschew bill. Uh, and, and that bill would effectively just say all of these technologies that have nothing to do with piracy or copyright, those are inherently lawful. So jailbreaking, unlocking, accessibility technology for persons who are blind and deaf, all those are just lawful, period. And you don't have to get permission from a government bureaucrat. And I think that makes the most sense, which is why it's got endorsed by a whole bunch of groups both on the left and the right, you know, groups like Freedom Works and R Street that haven't really been involved in technology conversations before. So write your member of Congress. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, let's end with some privacy discussion. Because this is the best secret project name ever, I don't know how we cannot discuss Flying Pig. Uh, this is something you pointed to, Derek, in your Twitter stream this week. Uh, article at Tech Dirt, running down information about NSA leaks, etc. And a revelation about a program called Flying Pig, which is basically... Uh, the assertion that the NSA or GCHQ has been running man in the middle attacks on internet services like Google, masquerading as Google servers. Uh, to what end, Derek? Why, why would you even do this? Well, I mean, the, the clear answer here is to intercept traffic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to pretend like you're Google, um, you know, to be able to kind of keep an eye on everything. And it's funny that they called it, you know, this, this term. I almost wonder if there's somebody at the NSA whose job is to come up with really terrible names for programs. The other program <laughs> that came to my mind is Project Omnivore, uh, which by, <laughs> you know, by, by definition, you know, it means everything. And then they're trying to say, oh, Project Omnivore is not collecting everything you see. Well, you just named it Project Omnivore. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Uh, these kind of Orwellian names that, uh, um, or also the other one was total threat awareness, uh, which is, again <laughs> is like literally out of something from a science fiction, you know, movie. Yes. Um, but effectively here, you know, acting as a middleman for Google, they're able to intercept encrypted communications. And, uh, that makes it particularly troubling because people are having these, these secure conversations that are encrypted and little they know their conversations actually routed through an NSA server. Um, it's pretty troubling. Right. And so the, the coda to that is that Al Jazeera America is reporting that newly revealed documents show that, you know, after this man in the middle attack has been run and your encrypted traffic has been uh, collected, that, by the way, the decryption is right out the window, or the encryption is right out the window, that uh, net encryption has been broken uh, by the NSA. Um, according to what's being reported here. And I guess people should, maybe aren't that surprised about all that. But when you think about it, uh, this is what we rely on, not just governments rely on to run their espionage, but this is what people rely on to keep all of their financial and personal data secure. And if it's all just fair game, that causes people a bit of trepidation. Any thoughts, Derek? No, I mean that's that's exactly right. It's the the Al Jazeera example is just unbelievable. Um, you know, I actually know some people who work for Al Jazeera, uh, and this was obviously you know all over their radar. But the idea that somehow uh, you know a foreign news outlet is going to be um, you know able to have this level of dragnet surveillance because of foreign surveillance, you know, it, it really it, it's 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 troubling and uh you know I, I know that there are not a lot of other news outlets that are pretty scared as well such as russia today uh and i'm not defending you know everything that russia today or al jazeera has put out there but these are um you know news outlets al jazeera in particular are a very legitimate news outlet uh so the idea that their you know personal communications being intercepted in this way or potentially their skype calls to and back uh you know from uh uh was it dubai um, and Russia today back to Moscow is um, it's not what you expect from a government that's supposed to be, uh, you know, leaving the fourth estate alone. Um, that's for sure. Right. And the NSA just 
throws up its hands and says, look, we're the NSA. Uh, the quote here is uh, that deciphering encrypted communications is not a secret and is not news. And anything that yesterday's disclosures add to the ongoing public debate is outweighed by the roadmap they give to our adversaries about the specific techniques we are trying, we are using to try to intercept their communications in our attempts to keep America and our allies safe. So Evan, are you concerned about the NSA just saying, yeah, we break encryption. That's that's what we do. We're the NSA. No, I think, in, you know, I come down on the side of saying, well, you know, that's the NSA's job. And if they weren't mm -hmm. doing stuff like that, they wouldn't be doing their job. And, you know, they would be falling down and letting us, you know, disappointing us, letting us down. And it's not historically unprecedented. I mean, decryption goes all the way back to ancient Rome, uh, <laughs> probably earlier. I mean, in, if you look in the 20th century, I mean, there was this interesting uh, undertaking by the U.S. government called Project Venona, uh, where it captured a bunch of information from the Soviets, you know, who were our allies in World War II, you know, captured Soviet communications during World War II and um, actually, you know, kept uh, the process of decrypting that stuff going alive all the way into the 80s. And so this involved the NSA as well. So, you know, that's just the job of what the NSA is, is supposed to do. And it's not unprecedented. And I, I think one problem that we may have when we're thinking about these things, you know, here in our discussion, we lumped the flying pig issue in with this. And that, that's, that's obviously where the, the rub is for us when it comes to this, because our fear, our concern naturally is that the NSA is going to be turning around and using decryption technologies against us. And with Ed Snowden and the revelations, you know, that, that concern is legitimate and it's the knee jerk reaction to think about that rather than to think, oh good, the NSA is keeping us safe from uh, whomever it would be who uh, in, in foreign soil who would come and do us, do us harm. So we, you know, gloss over the fact that it's the, the actual NSA's job to do that. With the flying pig stuff, I think the the import of the name is actually even um, more sinister than you know some of the goofy stuff before, like omnivore tro total threat awareness. Because you know, flying pig, the the expression is you know that'll happen when pigs fly. It's as if right. somebody at the NSA said, well, we would never you know mimic uh, this and try to you know put up a false S SL certificate or whatever exactly is going on here. That'll happen when pigs fly. Well, guess what? It has happened. You know, we really <laughs> the are. Pigs? They are the airborne. Pigs. Here you here you see it happening. So, but the point being, you know, I, I think we need to deconstruct these issues. Maybe we can synthesize them back together, but at least in our discussion here, we've got to kind of deconstruct each one here and recognize the legitimate purposes of the NSA and not be so quick to uh, do what the NSA is suggesting is being done, just giving a roadmap to our enemies, uh, but but recognize that there is, you know, that the that the majority of the NSA's activities you know, we ought to presume that they are legitimate and actually advancing the interests of, of national security. Well, Evan, I, I agree with you on that point, but the problem is what do you define as advancing your national security interests? So, for example, under the Obama administration, there have been very few leaks of national security information. I don't think it's a coincidence that there have been very few leaks of national security information at the same time that you have, you know, PRISM and all these other programs ongoing uh, that can break through all these encryption schemes. And we know that reporters have been personally you know, wiretapped, reporters that deal with national security issues. So the problem is, is NSA-level surveillance that can break through all these technologies being used against American citizens in order to prevent any form of you know, whistleblowing or national security leaks, obviously with the exception of Snowden being a pretty substantial leak. Uh, and, and what that means is, you know, I worked on the Hill and what I saw is you would have, you know, the intelligence committees who felt like they have had a monopoly on all the classified information. You need that safety valve here, there. Otherwise, it's just a tool waiting for a president to abuse the system. The classic example was in the run-up to the Iraq War, where the Bush administration had intelligence on Iraq WMD sites, and they leaked it to the New York Times. Uh, they were the source for the New York Times. And then Dick Cheney went on Meet the Press and said, we believe that there's this you know, evidence of weapons of mass structure in, in Iraq. It's not just us saying it. The New York Times published it today. <laughs> and that's an example of what happens when you control the full information stream here. And Obama's even said that they're going to take unprecedented steps to ensure that these security leaks don't happen ever again. You know, the security leaks like uh, stuff about the, the killing of Osama bin Laden 
um, you know, some of those personal details being security leaks. Um, but that means that you really are never going to have any effective oversight. Um, mm. So it's, it's, it's really troubling. Imagine if you're a reporter and all you do is report on national security stuff. Um, I would assume that all of your contacts have been blown. I would assume that all your contacts have either been compromised um, and have already been picked up or are going to be picked up. Um, and, and uh, you know, the now you have to meet, I don't know, in person under, you know, in a parking garage like in uh, Watergate. Well, you know, that the Dick Cheney going on Meet the Press sounds like what we call in the law, Ipsa Dixit. You know, it's true because I say it's true. And, and that's a real... <laughs> A real, a real danger there. And I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's an intractable problem. If I had a solution, I would run for president and implement that solution. You know, I, I can't figure out what you're, you know, if Derek, when you're saying that, you know, the intelligence oversight committees in Congress, you know, exercise this monopoly, I can't tell if you were saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. In any event, it seems like one of those things that we should be very reluctant in pulling that power away from those intelligence oversight committees, because how else are we going to make sure that there actually are lawful mechanisms in place, uh, assuming that those legislators would not abuse that power and assuming that a, a FISA court would not do anything uh, that it's not supposed to do outside of the the grant of authority that Congress uh, has, has given it. So uh, I don't know. I, I, you tell me. Well, well I, I think I think the monopoly on intelligence by the intelligence committee is a bad thing, as I explained in a column. I, I want oversight. I want substantive adversarial oversight, but that's not what the intelligence committees do. I mean, as somebody who worked on the Hill, I wasn't alone in the opinion that the intelligence committee was effectively a lobby group for the intelligence committee to tell the remaining members of Congress there's nothing to see here. In fact, they withheld documents that the intelligence committee wanted members of Congress to see. Uh, they withheld those documents from members of Congress because they thought it would influence the Amash vote. Uh, so we, it really isn't an adversarial branch, uh, and that's the fundamental problem. But is the problem the lobbyists, or is it uh, a problem with the actual way that it's set up? I mean, could we just do away with the influence of lobbying and, and remedy the problem, or do we have to do something more organic you know, to change the actual structure of how it's done? Well, I, I was calling the staffers who work for the Intelligence Committee uh, themselves lobbyists, uh, because they spend most of their time telling everyone in Congress there's nothing to see here, there's no such thing as prism, you don't know what you're talking about, um, you know, Snowden's a terrorist. Uh, that's basically so what they do. <laughs> your solution, Derek, would be to have some non-governmental entity providing oversight? No, m my response is to have a adversarial oversight branch as the Church and mm -hmm. Pike committees intended in the 1970s, effectively make the people on these committees resign and be replaced with an average member of Congress. Uh, because two members in the House committee voted for the Amash Amendment, whereas about 49 percent of the House did. So an average member of Congress is actually more adversarial and scrupulous on these issues than the intelligence committees are. Gotcha. All right. Well, I don't know. Uh, we've already had Ipsa Dixit dropped into the show. So it's afternoon on a Friday here, California time. I hope that everyone has taken the opportunity to start their version of the This Week in Law drinking game. We'll uh, give you the opportunity to add to your consumption if you'd like, if you're so inclined. Because I think uh, every time we reference Senator Al Franken, that would also be a, tr a signal to you to begin your Friday festivities. Um, he is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy Technology and the Law. I don't know if you'd consider him an average uh, congressional or Senate representative, uh, Derek, or not. But uh, he is one of the folks who um, definitely pays attention to consumer and technology issues and likes publishing letters to Apple. And his latest one has to do with the fingerprint uh, security technology we were discussing earlier. He wants to know from Apple whether it's possible to convert locally stored fingerprint data on the phone into a digital or visual format that can be used by third parties. He wants to know whether it's possible to extract and obtain fingerprint data from an iPhone. And if so, can it be done remotely or with physical access to the device? Good questions. And then finally, he wants to know if the FBI under the Patriot Act can gain access to this data as far as Apple is concerned. He wonders whether Apple can 
considers the fingerprint data to be tangible things as defined under the Patriot Act, things that they would need to um, turn over, things like books, records, papers, documents, and other items with this data uh, qualify. So um, as far as I know, we don't have an answer yet from Apple. I don't know if Apple will answer the Senator, uh, but they're good questions. Uh, Derek, what are your thoughts? I, I haven't got a chance to read Al Franken's uh, letter, but I think that there's definitely concerns there uh, abound. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it to Evan if you got a chance to check out the letter. No, Evan, I didn't. anything uh, on this? I haven't read the letter. I just know he's good enough, smart enough, and doggone it, people like him. <laughs> there we go. I, he I is mean, indeed. Al Franken has done um, some <clears throat> some redeemable things for consumers, but he was one of the main sponsors of Sopa Pippa, so I would uh, keep that in mind. Yes, good thing to remember. Um, all right, let's move on to our resource and tip of the week. Uh, the resource is something you just need to check out for entertainment purposes, as well as it has an educational component. Uh, it is a mockumentary about the quest to bring an end to net neutrality. It's called The Internet Must Go. There's a good post about it over on Boing Boing. It's a 30-minute film, so take the time to watch it. The idea is uh, the guy with who who's turning a camera on himself is uh, playing a marketing shill hired by the cable operators and phone companies uh, to convince... Americans to accept a non-neutral type of internet pricing structure um, where, you know, you would have um, sites and services uh, priced at a certain level and your ISP has to uh, make deals and uh, pass those costs on to you. So um, it's, it's really, really funny. And uh, also, as I said, educational on the net neutrality front. So um, do check it out. Did either of the two of you get a chance to watch The Internet Must Go? I just watched the trailer, but it looks hilarious. So I'm going to watch it as soon as possible. I, it, to me, it has the potential of being an instant classic. Because, I mean, you know, I don't know if you mentioned this, Denise, like Lawrence Lessig and Susan Crawford and Al Franken himself are, you know, in it. And, and I, I guess they're being... Uh, uh, you know, they're being tricked uh, to a certain extent in the filming filming of this, but they, you know, expound on these principles. So it looks it looks really funny. I'm watching it tonight. Yeah, definitely. It's on my list. How about you, Derek? Have you checked it out? I, I saw the trailer and uh, I'm lucky enough to know some of those people. So it was particularly amusing, uh, particularly the public knowledge segment where a guy jumps out of his seat and he says something <laughs> along the lines of, you are the exact reason why this whole situation is so screwed up. You are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so you can enjoy the hilarity that ensues from that, I hope. And then Evan has our tip of the week related to the gangland decision that just came down from the Ninth Circuit. Yeah, it sort of has to do with the, well, I mean, it does have to do with the gangland decision, but the issue in that case was, you know, California's anti-slap statute and, you know, the right of publicity and some other torts and how that all applies uh, to that. You can, I wrote a post about it on my law firm's blog at infolawgroup.com so you can read about it. But one of the issues in the case, you just take my word for it, this is one of the issues in the case is whether or not the plaintiff signed a release uh, saying that it was all right for his identity to be disclosed in connection with this interview. And uh, one of the, 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 the real issue is whether or not he knew that that was a release. He alleges that he's illiterate. And he thought he was actually signing a receipt for the $300 that the producers of Gangland paid him to appear. Uh, and they said, oh, don't worry about reading it. Don't, have your, don't even bother to have your girlfriend reading it. It's just, it's just a receipt. Well, it turns out, allegedly, that that was a release allowing the producers of Gangland to show his face and his name in connection with this very controversial, very toxic, very dangerous subject of this white supremacist gang that was the topic of, uh, of the particular show that, that was at issue here. So the tip of the day is to, uh, uh, you know, there, there's something to be learned on both sides here. If you're not sure what a document is when you're signing it, by golly, make sure you understand it. You know, you don't have to be illiterate to not understand what something is. So many of these things that you're asked to sign in everyday life are complex enough, you know, get help and understand what it is. Um, but, but also, you know, in the, the side of the, the producers here, there's something to be learned. You know, don't, don't try to trick somebody into signing something if they don't know what it is because the issue of fraud 
in the execution may come up and cause you to endure some expensive litigation that really uh, is superfluous if you just make sure you're doing everything uh, correctly. So my tip of the week would be make sure you know what you're signing and uh, make sure that if you're asking somebody to sign something that they know what they're signing and don't try to uh, trick or, or deceive them. All right. Good tips all around. Uh, and it's been really fun talking with you both today. Great discussion. We covered a lot of ground and a lot of uh, different forms of animal life between uh, poodles and pigs. So um, <laughs> it's been it's been really interesting and entertaining. Derek, always great to chat with you. Thanks for having me on. Great to chat with you guys. It's a good way to spend a Friday afternoon. Yes, we'll do it again soon, I hope. Uh, anything upcoming that you want to uh, put on people's radar other than getting in touch with their Congress critters about uh, cell phone unlocking legislation? Well, we have a whole bunch of hearings in the Judiciary Committee on uh, copyright issues going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. So I encourage viewers to pay close attention to some of these hearings. Uh, you know, So far, there have been a few of them that have been substantive, but most of them have not been. Uh, so it's an issue that we really should be engaged in. If Congress is going to have you know, a dozen hearings on copyright, are they actually inviting the right people and asking the right questions? Uh, and that's kind of uh, to be determined. All right. Good to keep in mind. And we will uh, monitor what happens in those hearings. It's always interesting when uh, legislators discuss copyright and copyright reform. So um, it's definitely an important topic that affects just about everything we discuss on the show. Uh, Evan, what's new in your world? Anything on deck? Um, I'm speaking in a couple of local events coming up, uh, the DuPage County Bar Association, uh, if anybody's here in the western suburbs of Chicago, I'll be speaking there uh, on the September 30th and then the Chicago Bar Association on October 12th about uh, digital licensing. So, uh, you know, local uh, things going on. Uh, here. Otherwise, just trying to blog when I can on my firm's blog. I already mentioned that at infolawgroup.com, also at internetcases.com uh, whenever I can. Otherwise, just trying to keep it real and, uh, you know, do good things uh, for my clients whenever, whenever I can. So it's all good. What about you? You know, you always ask this question, what do you got going on, Denise? Uh, I don't have much going on, just trying to keep all my stuff in the air, you know, all the plates spinning. Um, so that's that's what I'm engaged in when I'm not on the show. I don't have any speaking stuff coming up anytime soon. And I'm actually really glad of that because the plates are spinning kind of in a wobbly way lately and I need to, you know, get them solidified and on track. So um, I got my nose to the grindstone on uh, work stuff and stuff related to the show and stuff related to chasing after family obligations. So that's what I'm doing. And sounds uh, like life. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's good. Life, life is really good these days and really happy and always um, so fun to be able to end the week discussing these important issues with you, Evan, and with our great guests. For sure. Hey, did we do a second CLE passphrase? I, I can never, we I did? always blank out when you do that. Okay, good. We did indeed. That's so it's in there. It's good. hidden. Good. <laughs> Deep in the show. Uh, but thank you for reminding me. And uh, folks, if you are inclined to join us when we record the show live, that is on Fridays at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC. Go to twit.tv and you can watch along with us. You can jump in our IRC at irc.twit.tv at irc.twit.tv and uh, use that technology that's been around from the 90s and hasn't gone anywhere and still cranking away just fine. Uh, also, if you are more inclined to watch on your own time in an on-demand kind of fashion, head on over to twit.tv slash twill. The whole archive of shows is there. Uh, also, quite a few of them are at youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw. We're on iTunes, we're on Roku, and uh, we are just thrilled that you're watching the show however and whenever you find the time to do so, keeping all of your various plates spinning on track in the air. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Um, you can talk with us between the shows and we really appreciate it when you do. Uh, email evan at evan.twit.tv. I'm Denise at twit.tv or come on over to our Facebook page. Uh, we're This Week in Law over there, also on Google+. Great place to shoot us 
links and stories and things that have hit your radar that we you think would be good discussion fodder for this week in law. Uh, also on Twitter too, great to um, see you over there. I'm at D Howell, Evan is internet cases there. So uh, do stay in touch. We really appreciate your tips and insights. And uh, we even from time to time have people, you know, we're not really a show that breaks news. We sit and talk about it and analyze it and punditize about it. But from time to time, I will have people shoot me some interesting tidbits that I have not seen out there before. So um, that's always great too. Uh, please feed us whatever you think uh, we'd be interested in. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for joining us on This Week in Law. We'll see you next week.